Good morning, or only just good morning. Um, welcome to stage B. Um, the talk now is by Dave Harvey. It's on digital medical imaging. Uh, just a couple of things before we start. Firstly, if you've got some free time today or even tomorrow to help with Teardown, we would really, really, really appreciate some volunteers. So if you could spare a couple of uh, hours of your time to volunteer at something, anything on site, pretty much, it would be greatly appreciated and you might get a free meal out of it. Also, we've had a wallet handed in. It may have been picked up by now, but um, Robert Durham, if you've lost a wallet, it's at the volunteer tent. And if you pick it, go to there, you should be able to pick it up. Other than that, I'll hand you over to Dave. Thank you. Right. Can, can everyone hear me? OK. This is, although I've been granted the huge honor of a one hour slot, this is still going to be something of a whistle top store. Well, whistle stop journey through a really large topic. So um, I'm going to need to keep going through. If there's anything desperately urgent, stick, stick up a hand. We've got a relatively small audience, so I can take odd questions. But by and large, um, if you've got questions, call me afterwards. and I'll sort out where I'm going to be and where we're going to be going. <clears throat> so here's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm talking about the overall pattern of what happens from when one of you goes along, let's say, sees your GP, he decides to order a scan, the most horrendously ambiguous term yet used in medicine. Um, and he sends that off to the local um, radiology department, they're still called, despite the fact they do all sorts of other things other than um, zap people with um, high energy electromagnetic radiation. Um, and I'm gonna use the example here of an MRI. You go and lie in a, no in a noisy tunnel and you're told that some pictures have been generated, a week or so later, you go back, you see your GP, your GP has got a report. Probably hasn't got the pictures because the NHS's technology is so bad they can't actually get them around the place. And that's assuming your GP can make sense of them. Um, but there's lots and lots of things that have gone along in the background. Everything from how the image is made, how it's stored, how it's um, indexed, retrieved, viewed, etc. And I'm going to try to go through all those various um, points along the chain to explain what's going on to give people a bit more insight. So, yeah, why am I um, the person to be doing this talk? Well, I'm an odd beast. I have a foot in both camps. I'm actually a qualified doctor. Uh, did medicine 80 to 87, um, though even then I took a year out in the middle to go away and do an MSc in medical computing. Um, did relatively normal jobs then for um, nine years, in everything from being a houseman working 130 hours a week with 80 hour solid weekends, um, right the way through to doing my specialist training as an x-ray specialist. They joked at my interview that um, I was asked the question, so Dr. Harvey, you've chosen radiology as a speciality, is that just because there are more computers per square foot of the x-ray department than anywhere else in the hospital? My answer was only partially. Whether I got the job because of that or in spite of it, I don't know. Anyway, so included at the end of that, after that nine years of um, training, it's still called training even after you've qualified in medicine, I then had a so-called career post for six years as a consultant, uh, radiologist, x-ray specialist in Swansea, um, during which I developed my uh, computer interests further back, mucking around with the what was then a relatively new standard for exchanging digital x-rays, which I'll be talking about more later. Um, it became a hobby, became a part-time job, uh, it was taking a bit more and more of my time, and one day when life got a little difficult in the department, should we put it that way as this is being streamed, um, I decided that I was going to make a complete change. So for the last 14 years, I'm a non-practicing doctor running an IT business. Um, we deal with the um, standards for exchanging medical images, which I'll be talking about more later. Uh, I am officially a sponsor here. Um, most people who sponsor events come here to actually try and sell. I'm not here to sell. If anything, I'm here to buy in terms of buying time. If there are any of you who are hardcore programming geeks who find any of this interesting and could possibly put up with being anywhere near Swansea, um, come and talk to me because that is what I'm actually looking for. Um, I'll, I'll mention it again at the end, but I thought I'd just put it in here at the start just to set the scene. So, what is actually happening when, and when this examination goes all the way through? Obviously, the images have to be made, acquired, call it what you will, and that, I'm gonna be doing a lot of talking about that in the next few minutes about all the different types of imaging and how different they are from each other. 
They then get encoded into a standardised form called DICOM, Digital Imaging and Communication in Medicine. Hands up anybody here who's even heard of that before today. Wow, a lot more than I was expecting. Okay, well, you might find the, the introduction to DICOM a bit boring. Um, they're then sent to the standardised um, system, which is, which is cross-vendor, which just about every, every X-ray department, every hospital's got, called Picture Archiving and Communication System, where they're indexed, that acts as the repository for them. They may be compressed, uh, and we'll, I'll, I'll talk about compression in a moment, which can save you about 60% of your storage space. Um, they then get retrieved back to a viewing station, and viewed, and there are different ways of viewing them, either as they were originally or in different planes and in different ways, and I'm going to be talking about that as well. And then finally, of course, somebody with the same sort of letters after the name as me actually sits there and writes a report saying, normal. Right, there's lots and lots of different um, modalities, as they're called, different types of imaging in, um, in radiology. I'm not going to talk about them all, but there's five that I'm using to pick on t for today because they're sufficiently different from each other to give a good cross-sectional uh, idea of the sorts of things we do. And we'll start off with good old-fashioned plain films, x-rays as most people call them, though of course they're not really x-rays because the x-ray is actually the beam of um, high energy well, f photons which actually passes through the patient. What comes out the other end is technically called a radiograph. Um, yeah, most people call them x-rays or, or, or plain films. And until really 10, 15 years ago, most of those were still done with 19th century technology. Most of them were done literally with a sheet of film of the appropriate size, which the largest size is 35 by 43 centimetres, with um, a plate on top of it. You, you put your, part, you put your um, part of the body by it, the x-rays go through, they expose a negative image, and then that film literally goes through a processor, exactly the same as you would do with, any, with standard photographic film. Uh, everything from a wet lab, which they were still using 25 years ago when I started radiology, through dry processing to keep, help, keep the health and safety people happy, and then through to, of course, some versions where they which were rather more like a photocopier. But nowadays, more and more of it is actually done with direct digital detectors, such that they, uh, it's like the same thing as you have it, a chip in your camera, in your phone or whatever, it actually detects the photons and actually records them on a grid, but whereas the one on your camera is that size, these are still that size, because it's, it's not really possible to focus x-rays. What is interesting, though, is just how similar it is to what you have CCD devices for cameras, etc., because you don't actually record the X-ray photons. That's very, very inefficient to try to do that because there's not many things which can actually record photons and have enough heavy uh, nuclei in them to be able to stop them efficiently. So what you actually have is what, I, which is what I've drawn as this black line on the on the diagram, is a what's called a um, phosphorescent plate. And as each X-ray hits it, it produces thousands of light photons. And if you work out the, energy, the relative energy of X-ray photons versus light energy photons, that works. And it's then the light which actually gets picked up by the detectors. It was the same, actually, with the later generations of conventional film as well. The films are responsible to the green light produced by the uh, phosphorescent screen rather than to the X-rays themselves. And then, of course, what you end up with is a good old-fashioned, straightforward X-ray. Very straightforward, still actually one of the mainstays of a, of, a, of a lot of imaging. For things like the chest, it's brilliant, it's relatively low dose, it's quick, it's easy, and you've got comparison records going back for years. However, taking that one step further, same basic method of distinguishing, i.e. how much X-ray photons get stopped by the body, you can take this one stage forward further, because if you think about that previous image, so that's a three-dimensional structure collapsed into a two-dimensional image. You're looking through. One thing can be behind another thing. When things can be uh, difficult to see, you don't know what the depth is. So in the late 60s and early 70s, an absolutely brilliant guy by the name of Godfrey Hounsfield put together what was effectively a skunk works project at um, EMI. Yes, that is the same EMI that produced the Beatles records. 
um, and worked out a way of taking hundreds of images from different directions around the patient, recording those digitally, feeding them all into a computer, and when he first did it in the, um, late seven, in the mid 70s, you then waited about three hours for the computer to crunch the numbers. Because effectively what you have is a massive set of simultaneous equations. If you've got, let's say, in his early images, 64 by 64 grid of um, um, points in the patient, and you've got, let's say, 50, time, uh, 50 um, readings for each position in the gantry, and you've rotated that round at one degree intervals, you've got a similar number of equations. You actually have to solve them. <laughs> and these were solved initially, iteratively, which hence why it took hours and hours on the computers that were available then. Um, subsequently, and in the meantime, most of the work has actually been done using Fourier methods, um, which I won't go into here. I've got enough, there's, a, there's enough Fourier to, to, to baffle you all later when we come to the MRI. But interestingly, in the last five years or so, people have gone back to doing his iterative methods. Now that the um, computing power is available to do it at a reasonable time because they've actually found you get a better signal to noise ratio for the same dose or alternatively and perhaps more appropriately you can have the same signal to noise ratio with a lower x-ray dose it's, it's more resistant to, uh, to quantum noise um, so that's what it does and I've, just to give you an idea I spent hours on PowerPoint making this work so I hope it does go as intended yay there you are <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so that's how, that's how CT works. And of course, when it's done it all, by the way, the green blob in the middle is the patient, in case you haven't worked out. You end up with a picture like that, which is actually a picture of my father's brain. Um, and, you, and you'll be seeing more of that as, as we go through. I, I do keep this very much family related, because I know I've got permission to use those images. Right, ultrasound. One of the um, non-invasive ones, this, this one's not going to be registering on the um, total population radiation count as shown on the dashboard at this event. Um, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on ultrasound other than to say that it's basically high frequency sonar, you're running signals in the few megahertz range. And I say that deliberately because in fact the modern um, machines actually use swept frequency ranges because the higher frequencies give you better resolution close but don't go very deep. The, higher fre the, the lower frequencies don't give you as good resolution but they go deeper. So it's, it's quite complex modern ultrasound machines. But basically, you send out, a, it's just like sonar, you send out a pulse, you wait and see where it comes back and where it comes back from, and you make a picture. I'm sure you've all seen um, ultrasound pictures, uh, antenatal ultrasound scans. Um, interestingly, from the point of view of what I'm talking about today, which is how images get passed around, the captures, the, uh, the, the pictures you actually take of ultrasound are almost useless. Because you don't have a standardized system for where the probe is and recording it and, and so on. The only person the pictures really make sense to is the person holding the probe who knows what they're looking at. We have to record them to keep the lawyers happy. You know, um, Medico legally you wouldn't be allowed to say, oh, I've done it, here's my report, and not have something to go with it. But actually, the images are of very little use. Um, so the, quite a few people now are actually recording it in video, and if you want to, you can actually encode it up in MPEG, and I'll talk more about how that works with DICOM later. Um, like almost every part of um, radiological imaging, the images you get back are actually single channel. They're monochrome, grayscale. But that doesn't stop people trying to combine different sources of information into the same picture if they want to. So what you can do with ultrasound, because as well as actually working out what signal comes back from where, you can actually measure its frequency. And with a bit of work, you can then use that to actually work out the speed of what you're looking at uh, via the Doppler shift. And that then can get overlaid on the image as a um, color signal, which is incredibly useful when you're looking at the heart, because it can be very difficult when you're looking at a valve, which say should be that wide, and has been narrowed by you know, 10 or 20%. Trying to actually get accurate measurements, and that is almost impossible. But because the flow through it has to be fairly constant or the person wouldn't be alive, um, you, if you've dropped the diameter by 10%, you've increased the flow speed through it by 20% because of the square laws. And therefore, you can really measure that accurately. 
So this is the sort of ultrasound image you get. Um, this is an antenatal ultrasound. This is actually my own twins. Um, and if you look hard at your left, you will see the head of my daughter. And on the right, you will see my son, um, who's 18 a week today. Um, and you can tell it's my son because if you look very, very carefully, have you, have you got the mouse up there? That's one leg, that's the other leg, and there's his balls. <laughs> <laughs> and he's sitting there looking embarrassed. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so that shows how old this technology is. And this, this was over, you know, he's 18 next week and this is over 18 years ago. Um, but that's actually, funnily enough, the capturing of these ultrasounds, which is of very little use, but was using vast quantities of film, which was not only costing us £40,000 a year, but incredibly eco-unfriendly in terms of all the silver, etc., was actually the reason why I started playing around with digital imaging. In these days, this wasn't even direct digital. This was literally a video capture off the only output which the ultrasound machine had, which was, which was a video. I put it into a video card, added the demographics, and stored that as a medical image. It saved our hospital £40,000 a year. It then caused them eventually to lose me when I decided that was far more fun than actually taking the pictures. Um, on the other hand, here's this other sort you can get where you've got ultrasound, where, uh, where you've got um, Doppler, sorry. And again, this is only really two-channel information. There is the, um, there's the reflectivity information, the grayscale, and there is another independent variable, which is, which is the flow. But traditionally, if you want to show two things, you don't just use two colors. You use one as grayscale and the other as a, as a false color scale on top. So it's, it's, it's a nice picture showing um, the heart with, with measurable flow. Right, positron emission tomography. How many of you have heard of positron emission tomography? Okay, most of you. Sorry? Good. Well, it's actually, it is a wonderfully cool me imaging method. It was invented about 20 odd years ago. There was only one slight problem. For the first 10 years or so they had it, they knew it was cool. They knew it was wonderful. They knew it was technologically marvelous. Nobody could think of a use for it. <laughs> um, they just hadn't worked out what you could do in terms of what substances you could attach the radioactive tracer to, and I'll talk about how that's used in a minute, how, what you could attach it to in a means that would provide useful information clinically. They have got there now, they've got various markers which they can use, which therefore guide your um, radioactive tracer to tissues which are particularly some um, cancerous tissues. So you've actually got a marvelous way of localizing where the um, tumors are because you've got a material which is guided there. What's brilliant about positron emission tomography is that whereas everything else we're doing here is working on effectively um, emergent properties, stochastic effects, you're averaging out all these things that are different happening. You know, what proportion of your photons get through? Fine, you've got quantum noise. How many are going to get through? How many aren't? And so on. Positron emission tomography, you are actually recording individual radioactive events. Because <laughs> what happens is that if it's a positron emission, beta plus decay, what's emitted obviously is a positron. And what happens when a positron meets an electron? Well, it doesn't make more, more electrons. They turn into a pair of photons. Now, admittedly, the majority of those photons are going to be out of the plane of your scanner, and you'll never see them and you'll never pick them up. But for those that are within the plane of your scanner, as we're showing here, if they both hit the detectors within a very short period of time of each other, you know that the um, emission must have been along that line. You also know the relative timing with which it hit those two detectors, and you know the speed of light. Therefore, you can actually place exactly, plus or minus, it's a few millimeters a centimeter. It's not one of the highest resolution imaging formats we've got, but you actually know from that single event where in the body it was. And obviously, you then collect a few tens of thousands of these. Um, there are practical challenges with PET, largely due to the fact that the um, material used has got a half-life of only a few hours, and you can only make it in a cyclotron. 
Um, therefore, you've, and by the time you've taken into account all the extra time after injecting it in the patient for it to get round the patient, etc., the, the challenges of actually getting your isotopes made, <coughs> isolated, produced to pharmaceutical standards, shipped around the country, injected into a patient, and then the patient imaged. When your half life is, I can't remember the, you know the half life of 15 um, oxygen? It's a, it's a few hours, it's, it's, it's very short. Um, and that does limit the availability of PET to major centers. Um, but it's relatively low resolution, so what you actually tend to do, it's a bit like I was saying with the ultrasound with the Doppler, is that you actually overlay it on top of um, other images. And typically, PET and CT are used together. So the CT provides the high resolution picture to show you exactly which bit of the body you are. And the PET then provides the functional overlay to show which bit of, the, which bit of that tissue uh, is, is taking up the isotope, which, according to what the isotope is, you can then tell about it. Now, MRI. Sorry. Sorry, where have I got? Position. Uh, oh, position. Yeah, sorry. I should be positron. Correct. Thank you very much. Absolutely, yes. I, I love nitpicking other people, so I can't complain when people do it to me. Right. We're now on to MRI, which I'm going to go into in some detail because, let's face it, it is the only modality that actually uses a strong electromagnetic field. So I have to talk about that here, really. Um, and we are talking very, very strong magnetic fields. I mean, and magnetic fields are measured in Teslas. Now, I realize most people, when they talk about, about EMF, when they talk about a Tesla, will be thinking of something like this. Um, but no, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, the Tesla is, is the unit of uh, magnetic field strength. And to give some ideas, the Earth's magnetic field, fraction of a micro Tesla. Fridge magnets, a few milli Teslas. High power motors can sometimes have a few Tesla magnets in them, but they're tiny. An MRI machine, needs to be big enough to take a whole patient in it. It needs to have a field that between about one and five Tesla, and they need to be incredibly homogeneous to within a few parts per million. So that's how they're actually built. Um, I was gonna to try to show a real picture. I think the cutaway gives a much better idea of just the scale of these things. And you realize why they cost you know, a few million pounds each. Because not only do you need to build this, have it this accurate, you also need to keep the whole thing for the whole of its life pretty much at um, superconducting temperatures so it's full of liquid helium uh, because you could not make a resistive magnet that was, this, uh, that was this strong and this even. So they're all superconducting magnets. So what is nuclear magnetic resonance which is what magnetic resonance imaging depends on and I'll talk about the distinction in a minute. Whenever you've got a magnetic field, any um, nuclei with an odd spin spin, <laughs> spin around an axis parallel to that field. Now, for those of you who have got degrees in theoretical physics, please accept my apologies. I'm doing a gross oversimplification here. I'm not distinguishing between the spins of individual nuclei and the overall res resulting field. This is massively simplified but I hope it's good enough for, for, for this talk. If anybody wants to shoot me down on my physics later, please do so. Um, but you end up with, a, with these um, nuclei, and we're talking hydrogen for imaging. They're either aligned with the magnetic field, and we're imagining there's a magnetic field going up and down on this slide, or they can be persuaded to flip into the other field by a, radio free, by a photon of exactly the right energy which also happens to be, by various quirks of quantum mechanics, a photon which has the same frequency as the frequency at which it is precessing. Because it's like a spinning top. It's, not, it's, not, it's spinning itself, but then, the, but then what we're talking about isn't its spin speed, it's precession speed. It's the speed with which it goes round and round. And that speed, and this is critical to the whole of the rest of the imaging, is dependent on the magnetic field strength. It's about 47 megahertz per tesla. 
So, uh, which actually puts it roughly on a two, Tesla mag uh, you know, two or three Tesla magnet. It means you're talking 100 to 150 megahertz. You're actually talking roughly in a sort of standard radio band. I've seen badly screened MRIs have all sorts of artifacts, which have turned out to be due to um, local radio sources or the local taxi company. Because that is the sort of frequency band we're talking. Hasten to add, of course, non-ionizing. Therefore, you've you're, you're not got the radio... Um, um, <coughs> you've not got the uh, ionizing radiation effects. So when, the frequent, when that energy is applied, it does this, it flips. But that's its higher energy state, and like most things in the world, when they're in a higher energy state, what they like to do is to flip back. So if you put a photon in to make it flip, what happens when it flips back? You get a photon back out. And that is basically nuclear magnetic resonance. Chemists do it for years. Any of you who have done A-level chemistry in the last 10 years or so would have come across it. They do it in terms of parts per million shifts. Um, and that's called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. That is not what we're doing. <laughs> this simple NMR is great for a test tube full of stuff. You put it in there, you blast it, you, you get the signal out, and that's fine. But it's not much use knowing what the signal from a whole person is. We need to actually know what the signal is and how much um, material there is. And, it, but, and I'm, again, I'm not going to go into details, but whether it's fat or water or whatever actually has an effect as well on the different types of signals. So you're not just seeing how much there is, but let's say, assume for the moment that we're just seeing how much there is of a particular type. We actually need to be able to resolve it. So you're not, that's the difference between nuclear magnetic resonance, which is the overall effect, and magnetic resonance imaging, which is where you're actually resolving it into a picture. And in order to do that, of course, you need to have something which is different about the different directions. So as well, I mean, it was on the diagram, but I didn't talk about it. When you have your uh, MRI scanner, as well as the main field, which is this incredibly powerful field, there are also three sets of what's called gradient coils, which can change the field by about one percentage. It's typically a few tens of milliteslas um, from one end of the patient or one side of the image or front and back. It's, it's three, so you can resolve into three dimensions. Um, and I'm going to call them X, Y, Z. In fact, you can, by using combinations of them, and this is one of the great things about MRI compared to CT, because you can use them in any combination, just with a simple vector multiplication, you can actually image in any plane. So whereas a CT, you have to image axially. The other old name for it is the CAT scan, computerized axial tomography, because that's the only way you can image. See, in MRI, you can image me this way, this way, this way, or obliquely if you want to. And that's very easy. But for the time being, we're just going to assume we're talking X, Y, Z as fixed dimensions. And of course, these um, field coils produce a field which is in the same direction as the main field, but they're changing all the time. But they're producing a field which is interacting with the big, long, strong field. Can you imagine how much force there is on these, on these coils? You, you put one magnet inside another and then change it rapidly backwards and forwards. That's going to have some rattling on it. Anybody who's ever been in an MRI scan has probably been given earplugs. There's a very good reason. The actual vibration on these um, field coils is very, very strong and very loud. Um, but what I'm now going to talk about is how you actually do this work. And I, one of my colleagues down here looking at the side was very proud to point out to me, and said, am, am I going to mention Nottingham? And he was very surprised to feel that I am because this work was done in the early 70s in Nottingham, and that was actually another um, UK Nobel Prize, uh, on top of the one that um, Godfrey Hansfield got for CT, because of the work I'm now going to explain into how you actually resolve this signal into three dimensions. Lots more animated PowerPoints. So, resolving in one dimension, I mean, I'm calling them XYZ, but it really doesn't matter, you can just call them a dimension, another dimension, and a third dimension, but let's stick with XYZ for now is actually quite easy. Because of the resonance effect, if you apply a gradient let, and then you put in a, um, a pulse of radio frequency energy, their natural frequencies, which is what I'm showing here with the blue, this is what they would be, this is what they would be processing at, are different because of the gradient. Obviously, exaggerated for effect on here. So if you have your external radio frequency energy 
and you put it in, there's only um, the, the one slice of the patient where you're going to have the resonance. So only the, only the protons, only the hydrogen nuclei in that slice are going to be excited. The rest are going to be ignoring it. It's, it's like you've got neutrinos flying through. So they will absorb the energy. They will become excited. So everybody with me so far? We've now got one slice. Let's, let's call it a slice around my middle and call that the X. So, before I go on to the next bit, I'm afraid I need to do a little bit of a tutorial because it's important for the rest of it. I'm going to talk about Fourier transforms. Anybody here not know what a Fourier transform is? Okay, enough of you to make it worthwhile. If you look at your um, music system, and if you've got a fancy music system, especially an old one from the 70s or 80s, it may well have a spectrum analyzer display on it. Something that actually shows you all the different frequencies. Okay, it's actually a very crude, simple one, most of them. They, they do it by octave. You know, what have you got in the super bass down in the uh, 20 hertz range? What have you got in the middle, middle range around a couple of hundred hertz? What have you got up in the high frequency high hat? But the principle of what you do with a Fourier transform is just the same. Any signal can be broken down into a series of sine waves. And, any and those series of sine waves, when put back together with the correct phase, actually then can reconstruct exactly the original signal. Subject to some bandwidth of things, but that, we'll ignore that for the moment. The basic point is that you can look at the frequency way of looking at things, or the time waveform looking at things, as two different ways of looking at the same data. So just like... Um, you know, if you were to take a music sound and you, can, you could either say, here it is, it's with this shape, repeating, or you could say, ah, oh, yes, that's a signal of 14 hertz, a signal of 32 hertz, and a signal of 53 hertz in the following ratios. And they're, they're different ways of looking at the same. And what we're going to do with MRI, it depends fundamentally on this idea of a Fourier transform. So, we're now going to take as read that we've resolved the, um, the X dimension simply by what we uh, have, have excited. So in terms of where, what your screen, the X dimension is this way. What's behind the screen here didn't get excited in the first place and doesn't play. What's along the front row here doesn't get excited and doesn't play. But what's in the plane of the screen is the ones that we've actually excited by putting the beam in, having applied the gradient during the time we put the beam in. We, we, we put the energy in. So, we've now got these 16 identical pixels, let's call them. Okay, there's thousands in the real image, but let's, let's assume we've got these. Somehow, we have to make them all different, such that they're going to be solvable. Because it basically boils down to simultaneous equations again. So, it's actually quite easy to do one of the dimensions, which we're calling Y. Because what you do is that you actually change the Y gradient during the time when you're getting the echo. So you apply one gradient while you put the energy in. You've spun up just that sequence. Then while you're getting the echo back out, you apply a gradient the other way, which changes the, the speed they're spinning. So what you get out is a series of um, frequencies. And each frequency tells you where, in this case horizontally, what we're calling the Y direction, where that signal's coming from. So that's easy. It really didn't take a great deal of maths and, and work for people to work out how, how to do this. Here's the difficult question, though. You've used one of your gradients during excitation. You've used a second one of your gradients during um, readout. How do you actually try to get resolution in that third dimension? How can you actually get a difference between the differences along the z-axis? And this is what the guys actually got their Nobel Prize for, and I think they thoroughly deserved it. So, oh yeah. what you, you've used the, oh sorry, I'm slightly ahead of my talks. So you've used the X, X gradient during excitation, the Y gradient during readout. How can we use the Z gradient? The answer is that you use it in that gap in between. But what does that change? How can you use that information? Well, what it changes is the phase. 
if, you, if you've speed something up for a little while, if you've got two people walking along at the same speed, one of them speeds up a little bit, and then they go back to walking at the same speed. They're not next to each other again, because the one that sped up for a while has moved ahead a bit. And in things that are spinning, that's called a phase change. It's gone however many degrees it, uh, it, in advance. And that's what you can do with the Z. And what you then do, oh, I'll show you this for a moment, is um, you've got them all spinning. You then, and you have to watch this carefully because it's subtle. You then apply the Z gradient change, which does this. Did you all notice what happened? They sped up by different amounts just for a short while, such that if you look at it, there's a 45 degree phase angle between each row. So that when the top row is vertical, the row beneath it is pointing at half past one, the row beneath it is pointing at three o'clock, and the row beneath that is pointing at half past four. So we've shifted the phase by putting in this intermediate. Then, of course, at readout time, you apply this business about changing the speeds. And what we've now got is all 16 are doing something different. <laughs> and that's the fundamental thing you need in order to be able to solve the maths. Yes, this was fun doing it in PowerPoint. Um, I spent far, far too long on this talk. Um, so what you can't do is you don't have enough information just from one set of readouts because you've only got that one signal with that one set of Fourier, with that one Fourier. So what you actually do is you have, and this is why MRIs take a long time. Anybody who's had one will know that you're having to sit there for several minutes where you're going, burr, 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 and all, all sort of wonderful noises that they make, and I won't try to imitate more. You do it multiple times with a different amount of the phase encoding, the Z, every time. And you build up a complete, and you, you, so you have, have a series of these lines. Oh, how did I? I, I just went backwards. So each one becomes a line. You then, for as many rows or columns as you need for your image, you need to do that number of what's called phase encoding steps, and you end up pick, ending up producing a picture like this. And this is a real picture. And then, I'm afraid I have to quote Mr. Ben here. You do a two-dimensional Fourier transform, and as if by magic, a picture appears. And that is literally what happens at this stage. You've taken the data, you've done a Fourier transform, um, which, which gives you the Fourier transform of the image. You do the different phasing encoding steps, and out comes that picture. And I think the actual maths behind that and the simplicity of it, when you actually look at it in the end, compared to what had to be done with the CT, it's, it, it has a marvelous symmetry, simplicity, and as we pointed out, and why they got the um, Nobel Prize utility as well. So that's how you get an MRI picture. So where am I? Oh, yeah, 40 minutes in. OK. So you've made all these different images. You've possibly got a Siemens CT scanner, a GE MRI scanner, an Accuson ultrasound machine, and a Kodak DR, Direct Digital Radiography. How are you going to look at all these images without having to run around and look at all these machines? And this is what I'm going to talk about for the next part of my talk, which is the standard that's used for actually exchanging these images once you've made them. And effectively, it's a bit similar to what you have with JPEG. You know, everybody's digital camera, whoever's digital camera it is, will make JPEGs. <laughs> okay, there were people who tried to do other things a few years ago, but they pretty much died out. Um, so, and it's actually JPEGs, and DICOM is really more closer to TIFF, but we'll ignore that for the moment. But the point is that it's not just the image. It's no good just having an image if you don't know which patient it is, which part of the body, when it was taken, which contrast agents have been given, yada, yada, yada. So basically, what you have with DICOM is you have the pixel data, and you have a whole load of other stuff that goes with it. It's even got its own network protocol, believe it or not, because it was um, invented about the same time that HTTP was being written. There's variations to use HTTP now, but at the, day, at the time, nothing else existed, so they wrote their own. And it's, an, it's a very unusual standard, DICOM, because it encodes everything from the semantics, you know, in terms of when I'm talking about X, Y, Z, it actually defines in patient coordinates which direction thou shalt call X, which is actually left to right, which shall be Y, which is front to back, and which is Z, which is um, head to tail. And they even define that for animals as well, which really gets fun. Um, 
No, I don't want bloody updates. <laughs> right. I don't know how many of you were at the previous talk, but, but they, they, had the same, they had the same problem. Um, right. So um, that's what this standard is. It's actually quite fun to be involved in. I'm, I'm one of the maintainers of it. Um, we actually had a 10-year birthday party for the standard a few years ago, which is sad, isn't it, really? I couldn't find, quite find the picture of the birthday cake, but I've got one somewhere. Anyway, most imaging standards have got metadata. I mean, here's, I'm not expecting you to read all the details, but this is a picture taken by my IT manager of the favourite little character he's got sat on top of his monitor in our office. And it's interesting to see just how much JPEG data there is. You know, the tin foil hat brigade might find this really interesting to, to be able to see the, um, uh, the coordinates, etc. Um, but anyway, DICOM takes this to a new level. Because here we have a CT. Again, this is my father's, as you'll see in a moment, because the details are in there. Here's page one of the metadata. Page two, including his name at the top. Page three, this is where you've actually got some of the real fun um, details about the, about the um, image itself, like the image matrix 512 by 512, the real image size 0.437 millimeters per pixel. Six, 16 bits, one thing that's quite common about medical imaging is that most of it is done to more than 8 bit. Most is 10, 12 or 16 bit. Um, not true with the colour, most of that is still 8-bit, but, m but most of the CT, etc., is actually done to a higher bit depth, and then um, a grayscale transformation called windowing is applied at the time. But three others I've, I've marked, which are really, really important when we come to look at the 3D, which is the reason I underline them, is we've got the image position, which is relative to an arbitrary coordinate location, but a defined coordinate directions. So that tells you where that particular slice was taken, and also its orientation, which you'll notice is not actually one naught 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 one naught, which is what you would expect if it was just along the X and Y planes. Um, it's actually slightly tipped, which makes it real fun when you come to put these images together, because they're often taken not like a pack of cards, but like a pack of cards that you've slightly slipped sideways, so you don't actually have a cuboid, you've got a, um, a parallelogramoid, which really makes the 3D reconstruction quite fun. Um, then all the rest of these attributes, including one interesting one at the bottom, the pixel data. Because as far as DICOM is concerned, the pixel data is just another attribute. <laughs> There's lots of attributes of these images, and one of them happens to be the pixel data. You can actually have objects without pixel data, but that's getting rather silly. So pretty much for the last 20 years, every um, manufacturer of, digital Im of medical imaging equipment in the world has complied with this DICOM standards, and they can all now send their images into the um, hospital's picture archiving and communication system, which is a huge, great repository. I mean, they, they, they're typically, you know, hundreds of terabytes, some run into petabytes, um, which use the defined archiving, uh, defined indexing levels of a patient has a number of studies, a study has a number of series, and a series has a number of images. Um, and they're pretty much modality independent. There are some dependencies in terms of the low-level data. For instance, you know, um, tube killer voltage, which we saw there on the previous um, CT, would make no sense for ultrasound and so on. But the actual main bulk of it is pretty much independent. So the same packs can handle CT, MRI, ultrasound, and all the others, which is great. Um, and then it makes the images back available back out to workstations for people to look at. Right, I made a joke when I talked to Jonty about, well, you know, if I'm going to talk about this, I could really try to send people to sleep with a talk about compression. And he said, no, don't. This is EMF. You can't be too techy for EMF. So if you do find this bit too techy and boring, blame Jonty, not me. Um, so there are various ways of compressing images. You know, you're all used to the fact your JPEGs are far, far smaller than, than raw images. Medical images are so huge there's a lot to be gained from um, compressing them. Not least of which, of course, is in emergency situations, as I was doing for home uh, re review. If you want to be able to get them down limited bandwidth lines, you can get them there a lot faster if they're compressed. I won't go into the details of um, lossy versus lossless here. There's actually a lot of work showing you can do lossless compression with no loss of information whatsoever. All the techie people agree on that, just can't get the lawyers to. Um, 
but uh, certainly lossless compression, the medical equivalent or imaging equivalent of ZIP, is well worthwhile having. Um, so I'm just going to talk about that for a moment because it's quite interesting. The fact that you know everybody here knows ZIP, they know how it works. I'm sure you all know it's looking for repeating patterns, which is why it works marvelously on text and things. Yeah, where the letters T H E are going to keep on appearing in English and keep on getting replaced by smaller and smaller and smaller tokens as the system goes through. You can't really do that with imaging because you don't have um, repeated patterns as such. The predictability you've got in imaging is different. It's the fact that you, most pixels in an image aren't that different from the pixels around them. So it's the differences that you're looking at, not the absolute values and not the absolute patterns. So that's what's normally used. I'll talk about it more in a second. Um, though that said, for the, M, for the video and things, when you're wanting to do the ultrasound, box standard MPEG's got a lot to be said for it. And that can actually be encoded within DICOM. DICOM allows the images to be uncompressed or losslessly compressed or lossy compressed, or even for multi-frame images, it can be MPEG compressed, but still have all the surrounding metadata to explain what's going on. So here we are. Here's actually doing some lossless compression. Um, Yes, I know it's very, very techy, this. But what you do is you calculate what the predicted value from a pixel would be based on the pixels that have been decoded so far adjacent to it. You then calculate the offset, which in most cases are going to be 0 or 1. Most pixels don't differ much from the pixels around them. You then Huffman code the number of, length, the number of bits that are required to store that data, followed by then um, providing the data itself. So in this particular case, I've used an example. The Huffman coding, by the way, is arbitrary, but it's, it's typical-ish. So 207, 200 minus 17 would become coded as 2 needs, uh, comes into the range plus or minus 2 to 3. So it has that as its Huffman coded value, needs followed by two bits, which are 0, 0 in this case. The zeros only need one zero bit. The minus 1 comes into the plus or minus 1, so it has Huffman coding of 0, 1, in which case the value of 0 would mean plus 1 and 1 would mean minus 1. So that's the 1 there. And then you've got the 7, which is encoded further on. So you've taken what would have been, if, it, if this was 16-bit data, 80 bits, five values each time 16 bits, and you've ended up encoding them up in, I haven't even counted it to be honest, 8, I, th I think it's about 17 bits. So you've got about three to one compression there. And that's about three or four to one compression. And that's about what you typically get with this lossless compression. And of course, the great thing is you do actually get back to exactly the image you started with. As ever, it result, remain, it, like zip, it uh, relies on having predictable-ish images. Apply this to noise, and it will probably expand the image rather than, rather than subtract it. But that's, you know, that's what you get. Getting images to workstations. Um, DICOM protocol can be used, but again, this DICOM, because it does everything from specifying the format of the images through to the network protocols, even specifies its own query language. It's like a version of SQL, almost, because it sort of predates widespread adoption of SQL. This is a 25-year-old standard. Um, but it does mean you can find all the images for a particular patient and, and call them back. I'm going to jump through this bit a bit, otherwise we're going to go on. But you then have to look, how are you going to review such a large quantity of data? Well, believe it or not, when I left clinical medicine 15 years ago, we were still taking digital images and we were printing them out onto sheets of 17-inch um, by 14-inch film <laughs> on fixed grayscale mappings and then reviewing them out on a series of monitors like this, like this guy here. Absolutely crazy, but that's what we were still doing 15 years ago. Digital to analog to look at, which then lose, loses all the flexibility you could have. Then the next step was to go digital, but to try to replicate whatever we'd been doing in the analog world. So there was this stage where people had banks of 21-inch CRT monitors, uh, which was not much fun when combined with the NHS rule that you're not allowed to have air conditioning in offices. Yeah. Imagine these in a, going back 15 years in a, in a small office, and it gets very warm. Yes, uh, yeah, we could do this in here as well, but at least we've got some air. Um, then people move forward to looking at them on, in, in real time through smaller numbers of monitors. Then they realize that, in fact, with a modern computing power, you could actually look at these images in different directions. And I'll go, be showing this live in a moment. But these, these images were obtained by taking slices this way, and have then been reformatted into slices other ways. 
um, and you can look through what's called maximum intensity projection, and then you can actually do volume rendering if you really want to produce fun, fancy and fun-looking images. I, have, I say that carefully because oh, they are great fun to produce, and I'll show you some now in a moment. The medical usefulness of the volume rendering, it's great for showing patients, it's great for impressing at sales conferences. In practice, not many people actually do it. But the big thing nowadays, which is what I'm going to talk about next in the remaining five, ten minutes I've got, is that, of course, you don't need the supercomputers you used to need to be doing this. Your average GPU, like what I've got here in my integrated graphics on my laptop, is actually good enough to be able to be doing this live and in real time with really quite simplistic programming. So if I just quit out of this for the moment, I well, hope, hope this is working when it moves over. Oh, I seem to. Oh, there we are. Right. So there we are. This is the this is the image I was looking at just just now. This is actually my father's brain again. Two images, the green and red lines. Anybody work out what they are? Sorry. No, they're actually where each image is on the other image. So if I move where that, if I scroll that one backwards and forwards, you you see you see the line on the other. If I move this one which is moving a side to side, it moves that one. And you can do all sorts of wonderful things that would make you sick if you did this with your real head. <laughs> you can just spin them around, um, and so on. And again, all of this, this is actually a single 3D texture held in the GPU, which I'm just, and I'm just re-rendering that, that same texture again and again um, with, with a different matrix. To say how to say how to be applying it, um, and that's you know, it's relatively simple. This is simple cut plane, so you only need to do one operation per pixel. It's really quite trivial. Um, MIP. This is a bit more fun. Maximum intensity projection. This is a fancy MRI. I didn't talk about uh, it earlier, but one thing you can do with MRI is you can actually do more fancy things, like you can look whether things are moving, you can look whether whether they're flowing, and this is an angiogram. This is looking at the blood vessels in the neck done with MRI without having to inject contrast medium, without having to go putting a needle into somebody's groin and inject all the stuff in that you used to have to do. But the thing about this is you, see, you, can, you can just do this. You can look round. One little nice oddity, in view of what I was saying about phase encoding earlier, can anybody work out what this bit here is? Go on. No? Sorry? No? Now, it's his chin. You've encoded in that direction using phase. If you go too far, phase can only go from 0 to 360 degrees. If you go too far, it wraps. And what we've actually ended up with, because they didn't quite get the positioning right, is that his chin, which should be here, has actually wrapped round to the back of his neck here. <laughs> and therefore, I know, looking as a radiologist, looking at this picture, I know which was, in terms of what I was talking about earlier, which is the Y direction and which is the Z direction. The Z direction, the phase encoding direction, is the front to back, because that's the only one that can wrap. So we've got the wrap on there. But one nice thing you can do with this, suppose you wanted to look at things in, in detail again, if I go into a straightforward axial view looking down, I've got the ability, again, because it's all just in a GPU, really easy to do, I can do a cut and spin it around from there. So you, you can move stuff out the way that's, uh, that's blocking. And again, you know, this isn't a, this isn't a supercomputer. This is a bulk standard business laptop with integrated graphics. Um, going back to my father's head again, because it's a bit more fun, this one. Um, there's a prize for anybody who can work out what was actually wrong with my father and why he'd had to have this done because there's a few slight clues on the top of the head. <laughs> no. No. No, though, though there are times I feel I would actually be, I'd like to do that myself, but no. <laughs> no. Bag on. I'll have to work out what the prize is. You're welcome to one of my company mugs. That's the prize. I didn't, I didn't warn you what the mug was. Um, but in fact, the cutting for here is really great fun, because if you want to look at the base of the brain, which is great, which is really um, a lovely fun structure, I can do that. Now if I spin, you're looking down inside, inside the brain. And again, just pointing out this is all on, um, that this is just using a G GPU. This technology, which was, it's been invented and optimized for games, but boy, is it wonderful for radiology. Um, and then I've got another uh, image here. 
This is um, a jaw. It's a bit slower because this is a higher, I think this is a thousand by a thousand by 500 or something. So there's, you know, there's basically a gigabyte of data here, but it's only allowed for the fact it's 64 bits, um, 16 bit data. And again, yes, if you, if you want to look from behind, um, oh dear, I got stuff in the way. So if we go back to, let's say, the axial view, I'll put a cut line on, a cut rectangle, cut round here. Go back to rotate. Oh, let's go do it this way so I can see where I'm going. Spin it around. And now you can see the back of the teeth. Nice and clearly. Uh, and, you know, none of, none of this is rocket science. But it does give me an excuse to go back into my last um, slide, which is just about right, because I've got a couple of minutes left, which is to say that I actually, now, what I actually do is my business. I'm a sponsor here, so I believe I'm allowed to talk about my business for a few minutes. Um, but unlike most sponsors, I'm not actually here to sell. I very much doubt whether well, any of you guys here who actually want to buy a DICOM toolkit. Um, if you want to, yes, please, come and talk to me. But what we do is, um, we don't do the primary imaging, we do, all these sections I've labelled up here. We, we provide a software toolkit which enables people to convert raw data into DICOM to handle it, to do the network protocols, the querying, the accessing, and all that 3D rendering is actually our own software as well. So what I would like to say, um, obviously that's what we do, we do DICOM toolkits, we've got hundreds of customers around the world. We're supporting other developers. We don't have to deal with plebs. We don't have to deal with the end users. We, we only deal with other developers, so it's a great fun job. And guess what? We could do with an extra person or two. So if any of you find this particularly exciting, if you're a hardcore programmer, you love the challenge of working in a totally unstructured environment with multiple different languages, come and talk to me, or find me in the beer tent afterwards, and um, I might have a job for you. At that point, I'm finishing. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, you've got about three minutes left, so if you'd like to take like, two, two questions. questions or so, um, I'll take the two closest, which are these two here. Thanks very much. Uh, just a quick question about the MRI scanning that I might have missed. Um, you get frequency domain back from the receiver, do you? And is it just a single frequency pulse, or do you actually vary the frequency of the transmitter as well? You, right, you I was talking it in terms of putting a single frequency pulse in. What you actually do is you put multiple frequency pulses in and you actually image several different um, slices at the same time and there are ways of doing it with minimal interference because of when their echoes are timed. So the, certainly the generator can produce multiple different frequencies and there are uses for, for doing so. But the simplistic version I was giving here, what would be the one slice, would be a single frequency in and then a... a a multiple frequency bandwidth limited signal out. Okay, um, two small questions. Um, first of all, I recall that in radiology, um, usually you use black and white grayscale monitors with a higher resolution, like 10 bit. Is this still a thing, or have a current displays catched up? And I'd like you also to say something about the amount of um, gain you can get from JPEG uh, lossless compression, which I just found out today that it exists. <laughs> Never heard of it. Um, how much data can you actually save using that? All right, okay, first question, the second question first is the easy one. Because it's de data dependent, lossless, you, the degree of compression you get depends on the data you put in, and the, at the ent more precisely, the entropy content. You typically get about two and a half to three and a half to one compression. So you're typically saving about sort of 60 to 70 percent. Uh, but it does vary according to the noise level. The noisier the data, the less compression you get. And it was actually defined in the same standard as defined the original JPEG, believe it or not. That same ITU specification that defined the one, defined the lossless. It's just it's, it's rarely used outside DICOM. Um, the monitors, there's a lot of, I, I deliberately stayed out of it. I mean, you know, I had a job to squeeze everything there into my hour. So there are all sorts of standards about how, how many bits output you need to be displaying, and there's a um, consistency standard. What more and more the work is showing, in fact, is that actually properly calibrated 8-bit will actually do you fine. 
But what many, so what many people are now doing is they're taking 8-bit with calibration in the video card to produce the right um, um, lookup table in the card, rather than the previous approach, which was calibration in software, which then required a 10-bit output card. But what most people completely forget is they do all their careful calibration to get it absolutely right in a darkened room, and then they sit there actually trying to use their carefully calibrated monitor in a, in a room with the windows open, in which case your calibration goes completely to pot anyway, and you might as well not have bothered. And there's actually more and more people actually getting FDA approval for viewing on iPads. Bit dodgy to me, but you know, they're managing to get it through the regulatory side. I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but thank you very much, Dave. And...